You're listening to the NAPB podcast, and we're here with Dr. Patrick Hayes. Dr. Patrick Hayes, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, thanks so much, Matt, for this opportunity. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, a Barley Professor Emeritus in the Department of Crop and Soil Science at Oregon State University after just about 38 years of barley breeding and genetics. Wow. How did you get into barley breeding and genetics at Oregon State? Because are you originally from uh, Oregon State or Oregon no. in general? No, I was born in uh, the, the garden center of central California, San Joaquin Valley in Visalia, California, where my grandparents had a ranch and uh, my parents fled agriculture and went into other things. Um Fast forward to about 1976, and uh, I had been, uh, you know, kind of majoring in Latin American studies and anthropology and so forth, took a year off, went to Mexico, was just knocking around, wound up at Simmet, and uh, this fellow named uh, Norman Borlaug had just received a uh, Nobel Prize for his efforts, and that was a pretty heady time, uh, and so thanks to the good offices of a uh, cousin of mine, Paul Marco. I wound up being a trainee in the um, CIMIT program. And uh, boy, I just went back to University of Arizona, changed my major to agronomy. And then that led to a master's degree at Oregon State and a PhD at University of Minnesota on wild rice. Oh, wow. And you mentioned Norman Borlaug. How did that influence your decision did, did, as far as growing up in that time when Norman Borlaug you know, got his Nobel. It's, you know, how, what was the feeling like around plant sciences at that time? Oh, it was, there was just this incredible energy at, at Simmet because the place was just on a, a this upward trajectory. Uh, Norm was, was just adulated. I mean, he was a hero to, to all of us, uh, to the trainees uh, that, you know, I was part of this cohort of, of uh, agronomists, aspiring plant breeders from around the world. And there's this guy who's just gotten a Nobel Prize and, you know, he's really earthy. He's out there with you. He's encouraging you to talk to the plants. Uh, and so the the whole um, you know just that that vibe of the green revolution was just so uh, inspirational, and I think we all went back to wherever we had come from, uh, just committed green revolutionaries. And, you know, over time, then you learn that that every wonderful advance in technology also brings along its baggage and so forth. And so, you know, Norm was uh, was a human like all of us. But uh, what he did was an accomplishment that uh, that stands and uh, and is respected and uh, motivates us. uh, Many of us uh, still today. Yeah. And then just walk us through just from going from Simmet, then getting your master's and then going and getting your Ph.D., walking into then in wild rice, how does wild rice then transfer into barley of all things? Yeah. So it was uh, definitely a non sort of linear thing uh, in what we <laughs> involved in, in, in sort of like really two data points with a barley data point being uh, overlaid. So there's two of them. So I do this master's degree in barley at Oregon State University as part of the larger wheat research initiative uh, that was here at the time. And um you know, I just thought it was boring and hot and dreary, and there just was like no excitement in, in barley. And so my uh, wife-to-be and I uh, took our honeymoon before we got married, and we're traveling around South America. We ran out of money, and it's like, huh, what do you do now? Well, you go get a PhD somewhere. And so I uh, sent, uh, you know, I think a telex and a big package off to a couple of universities, and uh, University of Minnesota got back, and they offered a, a PhD program in barley. And a PhD program in wild rice. And this barley thing, I was like, why do I want to do that? Wild rice, I'm just, I've got this vision of the Ham's bear dancing across, you know, the land of sky blue waters. And uh, so I signed up for wild rice. There was no Ham's beer bear. Uh, there were <laughs> hip waders, there were leeches, mosquitoes, all of that sort of thing. But it was a, it was a great uh, experience. And um my advisor mentor, uh, Bob Stucker, was just absolutely terrific and instilled a, uh, a, a lasting respect for all things quantitative. Mm. So I finish up Wild Rice and uh, <clears throat> interviewed for a couple of jobs, 
uh, different things and different crops and different places. And, and along comes this opportunity at Oregon State. And uh, my master's advisor, uh, Warren, uh, says, hey, you know, we got this opportunity in Barley here at OSU. Are you interested? And uh, my wife and I had fond memories of Corvallis. And so we um, said, yeah, let's uh, let, let's do Corvallis. And so we uh, came here in 1986, uh, started in on the program and very quickly realized that uh, barley was A, going to be a lot of fun and B, that uh, beer is made from barley. And I needed to learn a whole lot about beer and brewing. And uh, that led to, uh, to, to an interest in home brewing so I could try to better understand malting specs. And that quickly led to an appreciation for the emerging craft brewing sector that those folks really knew how to make beer. And so maybe I just needed to ally myself with them rather than trying to do it myself. Well, you got to come in and be the barley breeder in Oregon when craft beer was like just taking off too. And when it was, you know, starting to become the thing and Oregon was, you know, the hub of all things craft beer. And how was work being the barley breeder at OSU and then working with all the craft beer uh, brewers around? How was that experience? Well, it was wonderful. And I certainly enjoyed the beers. But, uh, you know, without sound, uh, sounding too jealous, I've got to say that it was a really a hop centric thing. Mm. Uh, and so that early generation of, of craft beers differentiated themselves from mainstream beer by simply being hopped and then excessively hopped and then overwhelmingly hopped. And so <laughs> barley was really kind of just uh, still very much a raw material. And uh, and so we engaged with the industry, but certainly not to the level of our hops colleagues. And it really wasn't until recently that we started the whole barley contribution to beer flavor enterprise that that really I think the barley piece of it all uh, began to shine and and we really connected uh, more intimately with brewers and distillers. Right, right. No, it's it's quite the program, and you've been here for thirty eight years, and just you're you're coming up uh, correct thirty eight years. Yeah, so by the time that uh, my halftime position then uh, winds up in June, that'll mark the uh, the the thirty eight. Yep, the thirty eighth year. Yeah, and so you're getting ready to retire. Let's talk about that whole experience as being a plant breeder, and just some lessons that have been learned along the ways. Uh, what are some of these lessons that you can give to breeders out there that you know may have been you can reflect and be like. You know, this was the, my the, the success of, you know, this breeding program or here was the thing I would never try again. Here was my failures, you know, of 38 years of experience. I'm sure you have a lot of successes and failures along the way. Oh, yeah. Let's uh, focus on success. Yes, uh, so, <laughs> so I would we agree. Do, uh, we do have a, uh, a new uh, variety out that is called a uh, successor and that was kind of just uh, done in fun because the Oregon uh, Wheat Commission had uh, asked us to develop an Emmy tolerant variety and so we reached out to WSU Survivor and so as the resistant parent and uh, so you figure that you know kind of the the uh, the little tagline came along before the variety and it was uh, why merely survive if you can succeed and so what comes after a survivor survivor, but a successor. So make a long story short, I don't think it's a failure. We've been investigating the kind of why, but we had the successor in the Washington extension trials uh, mm -hmm. and Idaho extension trials, Oregon extension trials, et cetera. And uh, in the 23 season, uh, we could say that successor was kind of foundational. It, you know, somebody needs to be at the bottom of the pool, right? Uh, <laughs> so it was it was kind of hanging down there, but it was a it was a great uh, sort of uh, an experience. A to to think about adaptation, uh, and then two, what sort of other features or attributes does a potential variety have and what might be happening in trial data that uh, might uh, lead you to to not appreciate some of those qualities. And one thing that came out on, on this particular barley was that um, it, it's on average 10 days earlier than uh, than other varieties. And so in a trial system, that can be just a huge penalty. 
uh, for one, because uh, if uh, there are sh you know conditions that favor shattering or seed loss or whatever, then there will simply be less grain on the early variety. The second piece of it is that you know sort of typically in most environments where moisture is not going to be limiting, the later you are, the higher yielding you're going to be. And so I think one of the take homes on this and, and working with some organ growers who are really keen on the variety uh, that are in very stress prone, dry environments, then maybe that's where the successor might find its its shining place uh, in that uh, it'll just get out there in the dry dirt and get it over with quickly. Hmm. Very nice. So, so that's sort of a success failure kind of thing, but I guess the, yeah, one of the 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 real the satisfying thing from the malting barley standpoint, and and malting barley is really the focus of our program and and most programs uh, in the U.S. at this point uh, is the variety Thunder, and mm -hmm. so all of us are lucky to have uh, you know even a base hit, let alone a home run with the malting industry in our careers. Now there are exceptions. There is Don Rasmussen in Minnesota who just kept you know, knocking them out of the park. Uh, but for us, you know, Thunder took and and it's just so satisfying to have a um, a barley that's satisfying uh, the, the the malting company that championed it. Uh, the, certainly big beer, the, the big brewers were uh, initial users, but it's finding its place in the in the craft sector as well. And the the, the really key cool thing about that variety is that uh, it was the result of a long-standing collaboration with colleagues in Spain who really got the doubled haploid system going in our lab. Um, and you know, it's thunder has its uh, its its weak sides, and compared to its sister lightning that came out at about the same time, which is not a currently a huge industry success. Um, lightning is resistant to all kinds of diseases. It seems to have uh, a novel resistance to yellow dwarf virus. Uh, thunder, on the other hand, is going to need uh, a comprehensive program of chemical protection in order to mm -hmm. flourish or or be grown in places. Uh, where, uh, you know, those sorts of things are not going to be an issue. So, you know, you hope that a variety just doesn't crash somewhere because that would be such a loss to the industry and the growers who, who were counting on it. So you just hope that that doesn't happen and that in due time that we'll come up with, with a variety or someone will come up with a variety. Maybe you'll come up with a variety that yeah. replaces uh, Thunder that has the attributes that people want coupled plus with the disease resistance, low temperature tolerance, et cetera, that uh, we're all looking for. Right. Well, that's interesting. Well, talking a little bit more about that is where do you see, uh, you know, the barley industry and the beer industry in the next, you know, as you take your step back and new people come up and take the reins, where do you see the next like innovation and trends of the industry go? Yeah, so I think as an industry, uh, we're still going to to need uh, varieties that um, are, for lack of a better word, sustainable. That is, that they're providing uh, optimum, maximum uh, yield quality uh, with minimum input. And so we're always going to have to be shaving away at what those inputs are. Some of them are going to be a little bit easier, uh, such as you know disease resistance in some cases, maybe a, a goal that's easier to get at than, uh, say, changing the uh, soluble to total protein ratio in a malting barley, which may be, you know, a little more of a, of a complex problem to actually get a grip on. So I think that throwing the kind of the current bucket of tools that we have uh, at our crop, and that's going to be starting all the way back with crossing, with extensive field testing, uh, rapid generation advance, marker-assisted selection, genomic selection, you name it, putting all that together is going to really propel um, our, our, our crops and our industry forward. Um, there's always the, the real tantalizing bits out there. You know, you've got uh, editing, for example, uh, which is uh, so attractive from the standpoint for the public sector, I think, uh, as valuable validation uh, for candidate genes or the overall impact of, of phenotypes in our programs. But because uh, of the IP that's associated with that technology, I can't see that we're going to be able to uh, afford that in the public sector or that our growers are going to be able to afford the seed that would pay for that IP. Right. Interesting. High throughput phenotyping and, and alternative phenotyping things uh, are going to be uh, 
extremely powerful, I think. Uh, and, and some of them aren't necessarily like, like super high tech. I mean, when I think of high throughput, I think of robots and drones and, you know, and really right. expensive apparatus that are required to get these data. You know, other systems may require expertise and some some instrumentation that that is best handled regionally. But just like this morning, I got some data from uh, from uh, Kim Campbell uh, on freeze testing of winter barley's at WSU. And uh, it was just fantastic because there's beautiful discrimination between those that we expected to be tolerant and those we expected to be susceptible. And we just don't have access to those kinds of freezing systems. And so uh, Kim was so generous in saying, hey, you know, put together your your panel so that then we can run it through our system and uh, provide you with data that can empower you then to decide if you're going to chase candidate genes or implement genomic selection or whatever. So right. we had hadn't done that kind of work since, uh, you know, gosh, almost 10 or more years ago when we worked closely with the Marton Vasha Research Institute in Hungary, where they had all kinds of these controlled environment systems to assess that kind of stuff. But we weren't able to continue that relationship because all of us required dedicated funding to make that happen. So right, Kim's right. offer came with no, uh, no price tag. Gotcha. Well, and then it's just the collaboration that you do in your breeding program. It's, I mean, you, you continue to do that even to this day, just with, you know, with WSU or other breeding programs around the, the nation. And how does, I mean, could, how does collaboration, let's see, when you're collaborating, what's, what do you look at in collaborators uh, when you, when you initially start this and how do you have a successful collaboration with some of these people? Cause you've done it probably more than I've seen anyone else do it. Well, well, thank you. And, and yeah, it's, it's certainly a hallmark of our program and any success that we've had is a direct outcome of collaboration. I don't think there's anything that we just sort of did ourselves, you know, that you can, well, we don't even have a, a barley variety called beaver, for example, because there was no like single thing that just OSU did. Everything was done as a partnership with, with someone else. So, so what do you look for in collaboration? I guess, um, is, uh, you know, getting to know people uh, and then, you know, hearing them, them them talk about their research and their passion and then, you know, some kind of light click someplace and you say, wow, I can bring this to the table. Looks like you've got that. So instead of both of us trying to, to, to come up to speed on what the other one's doing, how about we explore some synergies here? And so that's just happened again and again. Yeah. Well, what's your favorite collaboration that you've done so far to date over your 38 years, tenure? Well, you know, it's, uh, I guess I'd have to say it was a, an enterprise called the North American Barley Genome Mapping Project. And if there was ever an awkward acronym, uh, that was <laughs> it. Uh, and so this was, this started out really early. I mean, the, the marker of choice was the RFLP and uh, Andy Kleinhoffs at uh, WSU uh, was just a, a giant in implementing marker technologies. We'd started doing double haploids uh, in our program and right there you had this synergy, which was just like, oh, wow. I mean, if you can start throwing markers on doubled haploids instead of on segregating generations, then you might be able to do a, a better job of maximizing the heritability of quantitative traits. And that sort of led to this whole blossoming of QTLs, which then led ultimately to uh, the, the discovery of candidate genes and effective marker selection and so forth. And that whole enterprise involve virtually every public sector program in the US in some form or the other. And it was all spearheaded by the American Malting Barley Association. Uh, and uh, under their auspices, in, it, we secured federal funding to drive this enterprise. So I think it was just a tremendous nucleating force uh, that mm -hmm. we had. Uh, unfortunately, it fell under uh, a category of funding that were called special grants which were also known in the trade as pork barrel 
uh, projects. And so there were some very uh, kind of stinky projects that were funded this way through direct congressional appropriation. And so when uh, the baby was thrown out with the bathwater, why uh, then there was a regrouping process. And so again, uh, thanks to AMBA, there was kind of a redirection uh, of those energies. So uh, we're still securing federal funding, but it's extremely focused. And some examples would be the SCAB program uh, the and uh, the uh, Small Grains Genomics Initiative. Initiative, et cetera, uh, the barley uh, pest initiative that uh, that Ashley uh, McFarland's now spearheading out of AMBA is just again bringing all kinds of uh, different breeding programs across the country, targeting diseases and pests uh, of importance in their areas, and and all collaborating. Yeah, well, it's such a big fun group to be a part of too. I mean, just going down to you gave a talk down in uh, San. Uh, San Diego for Barley Improvement Conference. And it was just a super collaborative community. And it was just fun to be a part of, for sure. Um, and it's just it, continuing that collaboration is uh, just one of those things where it's just, it's just a nice group to be a part of, just a good bunch of scientists and industry. I mean, it's hard to be in this industry and not have fun with it, at least, you know, because the end product is beer, ultimately. <laughs> Well, for sure. And, you know, there we can't forget food. We can't forget, uh, you know, and I think feed is going to come back as we see climate change and we see, you know, transportation cost changes and that sort of thing. And so barley really is this incredibly versatile multi-use crop. But, uh, you know, the, the overall value is such that that if we don't collaborate, we're all going to wither. <laughs> There's right. no way that any individual state can fully support the level of activity that we all engage in. Right. No, and talking with that, I mean, you're being a professor at uh, WSU or OSU as well, not WSU. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tempting, you've, mind you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've you've taught and mentored uh, many students coming through your program. How many students have you ha have you taught, or how many students have gone through your program with either a master's or a PhD at this moment? Mm, I would need to uh, I'll get back to you on the exact yep. number, but it's thirty plus. Thirty plus uh, that, students. Yeah, that I have directly advised, and then of course there's then the larger group of students that you co-advise or that you're on their committee or something like that. So uh, definitely uh, a phenomenal cohort. Um, you know, all of them. They're like your kids. I mean, they're your academic kids. Uh, you know, you love them all. They, they've all excelled in one way or the other. They've all taught us something. They've all carried our program forward in some way. Mm -hmm. Can you give a specific example of maybe a certain student that stood out or maybe even some sort of uh, mentor or, or even another mentee that, or mentor that you've had in your life that has, you know, really impacted you or has a student impacted you in uh, a couple of ways? Yeah, well, certainly the relationships are reciprocal. I mean, it does kind of start out with the mentor mentee thing, but by the end of the day, it's like, you know, who is the who's the guide and uh and and who's the the person being guided, but you know, one of the advantages of, of uh, impending retirement is uh, that it's easier to remember recent things than uh, those in the distant past. And so uh, a very recent student is Campbell Morrissey, uh, my final uh, PhD student. And uh, Campbell is now director of operations at, at Freem uh, Brewing in Hood River. And, uh, you know, Campbell is just this, this boundless fount of energy and insight and so forth. And uh, just and dogged determination. I mean, here's a guy who had a master's in distilling and, uh, you know, was could have just, you know, stayed with that career if he'd wanted to, but wanted to explore barley raw materials. Plant breeding is, is rather distant to his whole space, but he comes in, sees what we're doing as plant breeders, is now back to running a brewery. And, you know, who knows where this guy's going to go. But most recently, we've been working on the zero glycosidic nitrile uh, matter in barley. And uh, and Campbell has just really taken the lead on that. 
in terms of uh, participating in the development of those varieties, the designing and implementing trials to assess the management of those varieties. And then currently, then we're sort of into this almost marketing phase uh, of it, where he's written some, I, I think, very uh, important kind of popular press articles in Artisan Spirits, and then he and Harmony Bettenhausen at the Hartwick Center for Craft Food and Beverage then are then, you know, pushing this within the distilling industry. And so, I mean, we're to the point now where, you know, I'm learning from Campbell as much as, as uh, I hope he learned from me. Right. Well, that's amazing. No, and I've got to meet Campbell and man, that was, uh, it's impressive to see, you know, the, the brewery that he's, uh, in, that he's running right now. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I can see that in him and he's always thinking of new ideas and new things. Um, one question that I had as you're in, as you're getting to the end of your career, what advice do you have for young scientists who are just graduating like myself? And then what advice do you have for other scientists who are, might be, you know, coming to the end of their careers? What, what advice can you give them as well? Well, I think there's a single piece of advice that I would give to to anyone, including my own kids, is just live a life of of where you are infinitely curious, and and don't assume you really know everything about anything. Right. And so, if you're just driven and impelled to to try to understand things uh, uh, from a different perspective or uh, in a deeper way, I think that's just going to serve you so well. Um, so that that's kind of general advice. Uh, as far as like the 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 scientist sort of starting out, uh, it's it's I'll give you a really tough assignment, and that is keep up on the literature. I mean that's a, a, an ever increasing challenge as to how you can filter what all the information that's out there. And then uh, attend as many seminars as you can. I mean, there's just been a tremendous, you know, I think it's, it COVID really drove this, like a falling off of seminar series. But as an academic nucleating agent, they are so powerful. Mm -hmm. No, I would agree. So so get out to those things as you can. And then for those that are retiring, uh, I, I'm trying desperately to follow my own advice, which is to only answer questions and do not uh, offer unsolicited opinions. Fair enough. <laughs> All fun. Uh, the, getting wrapping up this podcast, um, I just kind of want to, you know, a little on the lighter side of things. Um, can you share one of your most memorable moments with working in Barley or even back to your Simit days uh, working with Borlaug or, you know, what what can you take from this that, you know, you that is just this is the moment of barley. This is why I'm in this career of plant sciences and plant breeding. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Looking back on your extensive career. Well, you know, as, as in the case of identifying Campbell as a, as a student, that's, that's pretty recent past. Uh, I mean, it also go into the pretty recent past in terms of a barley breeding experience and that's with my long-term colleague, Scott Fisk, who manages our field program, our malt house, and is now coming into the role of assistant plant breeder here at uh, Oregon State. And so for a couple of years now, Scott and I have headed down to Southern Idaho, uh, to the Burley, Idaho area, to meet up with the Great Western people and to look at uh, the varieties that we've developed under uh, commercial production or uh, potential varieties that are in the preliminary stages of, of seed increase. And so those visits are just, you know, incredibly rewarding. And, and the capstone of them is that every time that Scott and I've done this, we are upgraded at the rental car counter with some sort of muscle car. And so <laughs> we've got this reputation to uh, uphold now in, in Southern Idaho. The first round was the convertible Mustang, mm -hmm. you know, and there Classic. we are just careening around the back roads of, uh, of Southern Idaho in this thing. And then uh, this last round was the Dodge Charger. And so uh, we're, we're planning one more of these things. And these cars are kind of out of character for us. You know, my, my, my daily drive is a 1966 Volvo 122 
through Amazon and, and, and Scott's got kind of, you know, functional cars, but I think he'd really like to have maybe a seventies El Camino of some kind. Uh, but these muscle cars are, are just a hoot. And so we've got this question. The great Western guys are wanting to know what we're going to show up in this time in Southern Idaho. It would be, yeah. What do you think you're going to get? What are you hoping for? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, it, 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 it's hard. Maybe, uh, you know, we'd have to go to one of these like used car places and get a gremlin or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling it's just going to be a transit van. They're going to show up in. And this is the <laughs> only thing that they have available. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you just fill it with coolers and you become the joy bus, you know? Right, right exactly. Right, yeah. Oh, fun. Well, uh, yeah, no, this has been absolutely a pleasure uh talking with you uh this is you know i'm i'm hoping these the listeners will you know gain something from this i'm sure they will i know i have and is there any last uh remarks that you want to say before heading out any any plugs you want to do facebook instagram i'm sure you're on tiktok uh, big time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I've yet to open my Twitter account, which is just as well, because it would have to be X now. Right. So, right. Yeah. So, no, not a whole lot of social media stuff out there. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, work hard, have fun and uh, enjoy your crop, reach out out, uh, discover new opportunities. And then uh, I'm, I'm kind of shifting my focus now uh, in plant breeding and genetics to aqualesias, columbines. Oh. Uh, and so they're just, uh, you know, and, and, and I think I'm going to need some help in, uh, with that process. And so anyone who's got uh, insights, who sees a really fascinating columbine when they're out hiking somewhere, uh, you know, market, get some seed if, if it's in a situation where that's permitted. And I've got kind of an evolving series of common garden experiments around the, the, the country where people are growing these things and the, the reproductive biology is fascinating. The, the phenotypic diversity is amazing. The pollinator biology relationships with the plant or something else. So anyone who's interested in aqualesias, please drop a line. My email is going to continue at Oregon State uh, as long as there is email. So keep in touch. That's perfect. I will definitely help out on that and I'll be sending you some seed. That sounds like an amazing project. Cool. Well, thanks so much, fun. Matt. Well, Wishing you thanks. every success, wrapping well, up your thesis you. on to the next career and then uh, in collecting those column marks. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care. Yeah.